Mexico, PEN America. So this event is a result of two nonprofits collaborating um, to bring these voices forward. Um, so we're really happy to have you all here. This is an event that's had, we've had incredible feedback. So I think we're gonna organize events like this in the future as well. Um, so Living Tongues Institute, uh, we're a nonprofit uh, based in, our director is based in Salem, Oregon, where the wildfires are very severe right now. Um, so a lot of, um, and other, and some of our other team members are there too on the West Coast. So our hearts really go out to them. Um, I'm coming to you from Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, and uh, we have researchers at Living Tongues based in different parts of the US and around the world. We work on a lot of different endangered language projects in many different communities. Um, and so some of the work we do um, uh, is to empower community activists, language activists with their endangered languages. So we offer training and support and equipment for indigenous language activists who are struggling to document their languages and revitalize them and bring them back into the public eye and make them known in their communities. So that's one of the things that we do. Um, we also do a lot on the scientific documentation side. Um, so we produce dictionaries and grammars for languages that not, have not been well described. Um, so that's one of our, our, main, um, our main tasks as well. And wherever possible, we also partner with um, local linguists, um, a community linguists and linguists in the countries where we, where we work um, to, to work on these languages and to produce um, uh, locally specific uh, resources and publications. Um, oh, great, I see. Leanne Hinton is joining the call too. Welcome Leanne Hinton, <laughs> another wonderful ling linguist joining the call. Welcome Leanne, we're so lucky to have you on the call today. Um, so I, would, uh, I was just giving a little overview of Living Tongues and all the projects that we do. Um, right now we're working remotely during the pandemic. We're not doing any field work at all. Um, but we've been able to work uh, through Zoom and through Skype with a lot of our collaborators around the world to continue uh, producing dictionaries and grammars and other resources. And we've been trying to run webinars and events like this to create awareness about the issue of um, language loss around the world. So I'd like to hand it over to um, Diana for a couple of minutes. Would you tell us a little bit about PEN America and the Piedmont chapter? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Diana Kelly Said, and it's really nice to see some familiar faces here. Uh, thank you for taking time to gather this evening and we're all sort of overwhelmed with Zoom, but thank you for making time for this important conversation this evening. PIN America is an international organization. Well, PIN is an international organization and PIN America is based here in the United States. And it stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect free expression in the United States and all around the world. PIN champions the freedom to write, uh, to recognize the power of the word, to transform the world. And the mission is to unite writers and our allies to create, um, to celebrate creative expression and defend the liberties that make it possible. Right now, all around the world, creative expression, freedom of expression is being threatened. And I think we're all really uh, well acquainted with that. PIN Across America is an initiative that PIN started about a year and a half ago to establish chapters throughout the United States. So PIN program could reflect the diversity of this country and not just be centered on like in the New York and LA bubble. And there are six chapters across the United States the Piedmont, uh, Piedmont, North Carolina chapter is the only one that actually covers a region and isn't a city-based chapter. And what we try to do, what I try to do here in North Carolina is to really acknowledge the role of journalists and writers in, uh, as essential to uh, diverse cities and diverse communities. We are the pillars of, in some ways, democracy. We're the ones who are witnessing the world around us in various ways. And some of the programming that Penn Piedmont has done is a writers as witness looking at different journalists and culture creators and documenting this moment in America. We have, we've hosted a program on media literacy on free speech in a time of rising hate speech. Uh, we have, um, we're also planning a discussion with local journalists and activists or state journalists and activists on how to combat misinformation directed at communities of color 
around the election. There are so many urgent issues. And one of the things that Penn is, is really, really thrilled to partner with you tonight is that we recognize that uh, last speakers are an important part of their community's identity, heritage, and survival. And there's so much at stake if these languages are lost. And I am so thrilled to be, I'm a writer, and I'm often in like very writerly um, discussions, and I'm so thrilled tonight that the focus, while it is on writing, it is on something a little bit different. And it is an opportunity for me to learn, to listen and to learn this evening. And I'm really honored that Anna, um, partnered with Penn, and I'm honored that Penn could partner, and I'm so excited to learn from the speakers this evening. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Deanna. Um, I really appreciate collaborating with you and uh, with the other folks at Penn America. It's really great. And like, as you were saying, um, you know, it's really time to build um, a diverse coalition of voices, um, whether it's artists, scientists, um, um, Black Lives Matter, um, Indigenous activists, um, a lot of our work intersects and we have a lot more in common than we have different. So um, we're hoping that this event can, can continue that and bring that forward. Um, so I am going to start with, um, with uh, Felipe Lopez actually, because um, I'm just chatting here with uh, Margaret Newton, who's also joining us, um, but she's having a little bit of trouble getting into the Zoom room. Uh, but I know Felipe is here. Felipe, can, uh, can you say hi? Hi there. Uh, oh, can you hello. hear me? <laughs> yes, yes so hi. I'm so here. nice to meet you. Yeah, nice meeting you too. And everybody who's here can see me. Yes, yes. Yes, we can see you. And we're, we're recording this for posterity too. Okay. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, your work is really amazing, really inspiring. Um, if you if you want to share your screen, that's perfect. I also have your poetry on hand here if we if you want me to share my screen. Yeah, I'm gonna share my screen so they can follow me. I'm gonna first read it in Zapotec and then I'll uh, read it in English. If that's okay. Yeah, that's perfect. In the five minutes. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. All right. Take your time. Sakushin Lazata Yod, Rashtosin Yod, Sarvesna Yuta, no Nashin Re, Nahola, Tupchan Radishna Shtena to La Nirur Kana, Dota Gumbi, the Kikayola, Los Getrabuin, La Nape, Cheru, Aladinir Glory, Kashlure. Hi, good evening, thank you for being with us here tonight. And before I begin, I would like to recognize that I'm reading on La Nape land and pay respect to the, uh, to the people who take care of this land, okay? So uh, I'll read first, as I said, in Zapotec and then in uh, English, just so that uh, you know what I'm talking about. Mam, why do you call dia? Putia, eh? La chicha, zikia. Hi, everyone. Chine go call de ekia. Chine zak dios lio nap. Black laza. Grandmother. I went to church to get blessed. Had I died? I'm only going to the other side. I'll be back. Why did, why did they bless my head? God be with you, she said, and my heart was empty. Shin Rona, Kondrasa, La Shet Buinoa, Yek Mulnai, the money cage. The places where you can just scoop up mm. money is far away from home. I arrived here, I grew up here. What kind of person am I? I speak Zapotec, but only that people live here. I cry at night. What is my family? I live in foreigners' country. This place. Is a money cage. Shnana Naikam Nalo Yet Skaria Najibike Kariu Zeo Ladinoa Shini Zeo Shini Iza Rvandoshalu Shinir Wielo Rvanya Junu 
Arbea Zaușin is safe. Mother, just yesterday I saw you. I didn't have my papers. Today I return. You are not here. You left and I was on the other side. Why did you leave? Why did I go? I really miss you. At night, I see you. I wake up and you run off. I wait for the night again. And this is the last one. Deja Anim. We are we are Nani Natarik. Nataji. Arniana. Re Kitayana. La Jagika. Wunze Wunziat. Al Ruanrak. Azan. Rindiaga. Arkasi Nivia. Kedarjil did the world. Sneaked Nyaga. Logahish Nyana. Horse Runia Kuja. Are we all safe? Never glow. Career Shaba. No to Gakuye. Get Carielo Sna. Shigawa. Carea Mulgin Lua. Shoot a dego. Shuzenia Gishanim. Mitla. I saw myself with eyes closed. It is me that's lying there, lying still. I said to myself, I will not stay here. I will go back to my pueblo. People are coming in and out. There is a lot of crying. He's already gone, I hear. I want to move. My eyes don't open. I should have gone back sooner. I should have stayed in my pueblo. I try to yell. I look at my face again, my eyes shut. I don't have my clothes. Will someone else dare to wear them? There are no tortillas in my hand. What will I eat? I don't see any coins. How will I cross the river? How will I reach Mitla? All right. That's, that's it. <laughs> Wonderful, amazing. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Thanks. That was awesome. Um, I'd like to ask um, David Harrison to join the conversation uh, to talk to Felipe a bit about um, the origins of your work and um, any questions that uh, David might have for you as well. Sure. Zakshi Felipe. Uh, Zakshi. They, Thank you they, for that beautiful poetic reading. Um, it was such a privilege to be with you um, last year, it seems like a lifetime ago, um, in some of those pueblos. And I was really struck being a first time visitor to Oaxaca, but having you there to explain things to me, um, how important the pueblo is, each individual pueblo, which seems like just very small towns located just a few miles from each other, but each one has its own distinct identity, its own distinct variety of Zapotec. Um, in fact, uh, you and your colleagues have created, I think, eight different talking dictionaries now, one for each Pueblo. Um, can you say something about how the Pueblo identity matters? And this is what you referred to in your poem. Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, most people who are born in, in their pueblo, they are pretty much uh, linked to to the community, no matter where you are. Uh, you always will be part of the community, and always through different um, linkages, they will call upon you, even if you are as far as <laughs> as far away as in the state that you need to return and give to the community in terms of um, community labor and also. Uh, just you know uh helping the community to get ahead so there the, as for example in, in my case even though i have become an u.s citizen but my community will always claim and i always have responsibility to that to that problem thank you that's awesome thank you so much and um I realized I didn't uh, read Felipe's bio. Um, Felipe Lopez is a postdoctoral scholar in community-engaged digital scholarship at Haverford College. 
He is originally from the Zapotec town of San Lucas Chiavini, Oaxaca. At the age of 16, he migrated to Los Angeles, California, speaking no English and little Spanish. By 2007, he had earned his PhD from UCLA in urban planning with research focusing on Mexican indigenous issues on both sides of the border. He is co-author of a trilingual Zapotec Spanish English dictionary and has taught Zapotec language classes at UCLA and UCSD using a textbook, which he also co-authored. His Zapotec poetry can be found in the Latin American Literary Review, the Acentos Review, and Latin American Literature Today. His Zapotec short story, Liata Cha, I Am Going Home, was awarded the 2017 Premios Casa Prize, an annual competition for the creation of literature in Zapotec, and was published in Latin American Literature Today. So thank you again, Felipe, for, um, for being with us today. Um, Felipe, um, if you, do you have any uh, closing thoughts for America about linguistic diversity <laughs> and um, preserving the legacy of your people? Well, I think that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really fortunate to speak the language because uh, through languages, uh, and especially uh, Mesoamerican language, we have a different way of looking at the world vis-a-vis -vis, um, Western concepts. So I think that the work that a lot of the linguists are doing, it's, it's, it's really helping not only to preserve the language, but also the way in which we uh, look at the world, you know, hundreds of thousands of years in the case of Zapotec. So I really commend all those linguists who are working with the communities and helping us uh, in not just promoting, but maintaining our languages. So thank you again for the space that you gave me to, to be with you guys tonight. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to have you here. Um, and um, please jump in with questions for the next um, writers and poets who are, who are gonna be with us here on this call today. And at some point, I hope to talk to you again about concepts of time in Mesoamerican languages. It's such a fast, fascinating topic. <laughs> Um, so I'm pleased to announce that we have Margaret Ann Newton joining us on the call. Uh, we had a little trouble getting her in, but she is here. Yay, Margaret, um, can, um, can you say hello? Bonjour, very glad to be here. Had to get through a, a password issue. Like, accounts were linked in ways I didn't realize. So sometimes the journey even through cyberspace is tricky, but it's nice to see everyone. Yeah, that's right. The journey through cyberspace is not, <laughs> it's not easy, but uh, at least we can stay connected um, right now with everything going on. So thank you, thank you, thank you for, for coming. Um, I'll, I'd like to introduce you. Uh, Margaret Newton is a professor of English and American Indian Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where she also serves as the Associate Dean of the Humanities and Director of the Electa Quinney Institute for American Indian Education. She's the author of Bawa Jimo, A Dialect of Dreams in Anishinaabe Language and Literature, Weweni, and What the Chickadee Knows from Wayne State University Press, both of which are bilingual collections of poetry in Anishinaabe Moen and English. Thank you, Margaret. Um, what would you like to share with us today? Uh, I think that the the most important thing to share is sort of the way that we've managed to continue to reconnect our, our diaspora. Uh, Anishinaabe has um, 168 reservations and reserves across the Great Lakes. And we certainly sometimes grow up not even realizing what a big linguistic group we're in. Um, we're just one language of the Algonquian languages, but we are perhaps the one that's most commonly spoken. So, um, I'm not sure how much you want me to go on and share, but the thing that I often like to talk about is the, the things that I've done with my daughters in particular, um, and a lot of my young students this fall. I've got one of my students who studied with me for three or four years at the university in Milwaukee, who's starting teaching in her own classroom in St. Paul. So we're starting to see for our language that we're reconnecting again, a lot of these different points. And we have some hope for that next generation to be able to move forward. We see in schools that the, the language is taught. Um, so for, for us, that's important to keep going. We have a, a website and a Instagram page that my daughters were perhaps more responsible for the Instagram page, 
but it's been nice because they connect across a pretty wide space. So sometimes they'll post things in Michigan and relatives back in Minnesota will see that. Uh, certainly during the Black Lives Matter movement, we had a lot of ways that we were supporting our communities that we were seeing in need and in pain and we wanted to be able to say, so we posted uh, messages for folks in, in our language, we were able to say, so that we could be focused on Black lives and why they matter and do it in our own language, which was something pretty special to us. Um, I don't know if there are particular questions that you want me to address, but that's sort of the update from our corner of the language world. Well, we'd love to know your Instagram handle. I can put it in the chat sure. um, for everyone so that everyone can follow you. <laughs> yeah, you should check it out. My daughters work on it really hard and I think it's fun to see. So it's just Ojibwe, O-J-I-B-W-E mm -hmm. underscore net. And it's been really nice because they in particular wanted a way to connect images, contemporary images, mm -hmm with longer sentences. We have a lot of people on the internet and on Facebook and other places that are kind of doing word lists. Um, certainly they're connecting language tables, things like that, but they wanted a way in their venue that they commonly use mm -hmm. uh, to put some images. And one that's really powerful, you'll find it on there. There's uh, some women standing where a Columbus statue used to be in Detroit, and they are wearing their jingle dresses standing on that statue. Um, and, and so we put sentences connecting those and it's kind of a way to keep, keep the language top of mind and keep using it. We've also had uh, rules about keeping them positive too. So we'll make statements, but try and keep it positive and keep it focused on moving our language forward. I mean, my website, Ojibwe.net has a lot as well. Um, and so that's another place that people can find things too. Wonderful, wonderful. And um, I think that's so important to have the transmission of language happening in public spaces and in online spaces. Uh, because, you know, those, those two worlds kind of permeate our everyday. So that's where the language needs to be seen and heard. Um, and so that it, it brings it back into people's consciousness. Um, would you be able to read uh, an excerpt um, from sure. one of your recent books? Yeah. I I have them. I didn't know if I would have time. So if we're just all here having fun and getting updates, right? So the most recent book, the, if you guys can see this, it's like you're here with me in my living room, right? Yes. <laughs> so this book is, um, it's the Chickadee book. And my older daughter, uh, Nita Mazinbige Kwe, did the cover. So it's funny, we gave her the name. She was given, some, um, some elders gave her that name a long time ago when she was young. And she said at the time, mom, I'm not an artist. Nita Mazinbige Kwe means one who draws well. So I don't know if the name led her to it or the elder actually kind of just knew what she was good at. <laughs> but at any rate, um, with this book, it's, um, I have an earlier book of bilingual poems and I think in that book, you see a lot of dialect range. So clever linguists and students from our language group can see that I have both Eastern and Western dialect in that first group because I had worked in a lot of different places. And with this book, the Chickadee book now, it's a little more Western because I'm teaching back closer to where I grew up. And most of the people here just stay in the Western dialect. And I think I tried hard even before all of the COVID um, to think about our future and to think about what mattered and what things might be lost. So I'll just give you the, the chickadee poem because it's one that I had talked to my dad a lot about the way we just, we all learn bird and fish and tree, but we rarely get taught as we're reclaiming our languages, the specific bird. So Gitche is a chickadee, one of the little, you know, black cap chickadees that stay in the trees. And in our area, they're around all year. They don't migrate and go elsewhere. And so they're pretty significant. They're there through all the seasons with us. And just calling them a beneshi, a bird, kind of doesn't do, do them justice. And gidja gidja ganeshi is so fun to say, right? It's another example of how, like Felipe was saying, our languages give us just different sound combinations, different ways to look at things. It's interesting that English speakers would hear chickadee dee dee, but we would hear gidja gidja ganeshi. So it's the same bird, but people listening in different ways. Um, in English, I'll, I'll read it in English because I can't ever um, make it sound the same. In English, it says, the ancestors tied and extended it, the sweet grass telling us, making bundles, the, reminding us the world is not yet ripe. 
The marsh chickadee is in the white pine calling out, wanting to be with us. It's a ceremony, a way to be alive. And I write them in the language first, so they sound much better in Ojibwe. <laughs> so here's how that one goes in our language. Anako bijikana, anako bidoa, wingash, windungawe yangedwa, gashki bijike, ke gashka king. Kitchikitchikane, she, eagawanda, nundagas it, nundami yangedwa, manaduke yang, manadawi yang. So if you ever listen to those little birds, that's kind of how they sound. That was really a poem for those little birds. They have that little call that kind of goes like that at the end of the day when they call out to each other. So wow, maybe I'll leave that was that. so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh, I could just, it, it, ha, it there's something about the, the contours of the language and the onomatopoeias and the melodies that, that were coming through your voice. It was so beautiful. It was just like, you know, a little group of chickadees. Well, good. I'll put the link to it in the chat since we can do that in this environment. And then if any of you want to sing the chickadee song later, we have the audio on there. Because I'm a teacher. I like to make everyone else do it as well. <laughs> yeah, perfect. I definitely want to learn it. It's beautiful. <laughs> and I want to invite David Harrison um, from Living Tongues Institute also to ask any questions to Margaret as well. Let's see David. Hi, Meg uh, Buju again, and you know, I don't think I've ever seen you present, and I've seen you present many times when you didn't either sing or play your drum or both. And it's just such a wonderful um, acknowledgement that language includes music and it includes rhythm. So thank you for that. Um, I, I want our um, guests also to know that you're a, you're a pioneer um, not only in literary things, in poetry and um, prose that you've written bilingually, but you're also a pioneer in using Facebook for endangered language pedagogy. I, I think the Ojibwe presence on Facebook um, dates back, you know, well over a decade and was the first time I ever came across a community uh, intentionally using Facebook as a way to to create linguistic spaces online and to teach the language. And so um, that's an amazing thing that you've done. Um, the question I had was a theme that runs through a lot of your work is how people are connected to landscape. Um, I remember you saying that in Anishinaabemo and there's only a single word that describes all the, the five great lakes together as a single entity. I wonder if you could say something to us about how you see the language connecting to landscape. That's a really, really good point to, to focus on. Um, I'll try to be very efficient because for us, if you look at the earth from space, you would see the Great Lakes. They're that big. They are a source of fresh water in the Northern Hemisphere in North America that would be noticeable from space. And they are fairly unique in terms of their size and the amount of fresh water they hold. And we really, in many ways, center a lot of the way that we organize our thoughts around the, the play of lakes and land and swamp and the way water runs through the earth. And a word that has been particularly important to me lately as we bring all these thoughts together in our communities, and I think actually during COVID, many communities, people are experiencing a little more depression, a little more uh, feeling lost, and especially in our youth, we've always tried to teach folks they're connected to place and they're connected to the future and the past. And one of the ways I do that is remind them that this concept of gichigaming or michigaming is the one word that we use for all those lakes. You could use that to describe any of the spaces that you might be. So it got applied to one of the Great Lakes, Michigan, but it actually is a word that we have documentation being used throughout that region, thinking of them as one big connected entity. And the word for lake itself, zaga'egan, has a little word part, little morpheme in there, zage, which is the same word that we would use if we were teaching folks to say, I love myself, nizage this. You should all say that. Right. As a teacher, Nizagadis. like there's your lesson. Nizagadis means I love myself. And we've tried really hard to make sure that we hold on to these concepts because zage means outwardness, 
going out. So the Great Lakes are an opening. They are a space on the earth where we see a relationship and connections for us. You could say they're just a great big huge source of love and relationship and connection. And then we hear the echo of the idea of lake when we say I love either myself or I love everyone else. So if I say to all of you, I would say Gizaganinim. And it would make me think of lakes and the place I'm from and the Chigaming and hopefully I would see you all there one day. I love that. That's amazing. Oh, that gives me chills. <laughs> It's a good thing to remember. I mean, we forget to teach as we're recovering our languages to teach the youth how connected they are to well-being. I remember when I got my PhD, I was one of just four, I think, other people my age, because I'm getting older now, right? When I got my PhD for Ojibwe folks, I was one of very, very few. And at the time, everybody was very quick to say, oh, well, that correlates the farther you go with education, the worse you're gonna feel, you won't be healthy anymore. And I think that a lot of us have lived to say, no, you can do both. You can speak your language and keep going and keep learning and really reconnect our way of thinking to the world's way of producing knowledge. So I try to be that one in the university reminding folks to think differently when I can. I, yeah, I think that that's important to bridge that gap um, between indigenous knowledge, wisdom and ancestry and also academic learning and how we bring those different types of knowledge into the different spaces. And you're making a beautiful bridge, you know, and, and I just, it's just amazing that, that the concept of outwardness, you know, is like imbued in that word. Um, it's so, um, and, and, and the way you were speaking about it, connecting the land, the water, well-being, and this like sense of home, sense of place. It's beautiful. <laughs> I'll try and put those in there so you guys can all learn them too. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's really powerful. Yeah. Um, I would like to bring everyone over to a different body of water. Thank you again, Margaret Newton. I'm just, just loving your work. <laughs> Um, I would like to introduce our next, um, our next speaker is Tania Bluefeather. Um, Tania Bluefeather of the Scarberry Woken uh, community reflects her passions as cultural advocate and a language activist through songwriting as well. Her vastly diverse background and natural creativity are the tools she hopes will bring back her ancestors' voices. Scarberry Woken of the Cape Fear is a pre-colonial tribal nation with a long, rich, history concentrated in and around Brunswick, Leyden, Columbus, Pen and Pender counties of the Cape Fear region in North Carolina. Thank you, Tania, for joining us today. Oh, can, uh, you're on mute. There you are. Hello. There we are. Hi, thank you for having us today. Oh, thank you for joining. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Okay, I've enjoyed the program so far. It's great to learn about all the different things that you guys are doing in all the different places that you're touching. Thanks. Yeah, this is great. We 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 love um, we love bringing everyone together in this way. Yeah. So when you uh, asked us a few days ago to uh, be a part of this event, I didn't have anything prepared. And while spoken word is not my strong suit, I am a well-versed songwriter. So I um, just wrote down what came from my heart. And I, I feel like I captured the soundtrack of this movement and organization. Oh, okay, I, we're ready. We're ready for you. Song or spoken word is wonderful. <laughs> okay, well, I hope you guys enjoy. Here goes. My ancestors' words are a song in my spirit, a song in my spirit is me, a song with no words and no one will hear it, the song with no words is me, the song with no words is me. Wali, Wali, E A E A O, Yo Na, Yo Na, Yo Yo, O O, Elo E Lo E, Their hearts. 
heart beat is my drum. Sacrifice is how come I'll never quit this fight through blood, sweat, and tears. Soon they'll hear I will not let them die. And I'll bring them back to life. My ancestors' words are a song in my spirit. The song in my spirit is me. A song with no words and no one will hear it. The song with no words is me. The song with no words is me. And I hope you guys enjoyed. Oh, that was that was beautiful. I've I've got some tears tears coming up here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about Woken? Um, because um, Woken is is your ancestors' language, but it hasn't been spoken in centuries at this point. That is true. It is so far away from us and so far away from my generation we are literally having to peel back the layers of ancestry just to get a handful of words mm -hmm. um, to be able to teach to our children now and and keep our culture our culture and history moving and thriving and we definitely want to implement a language program once we can get enough material you know, we want to, and my strong suit is also working with children as a, as a teacher. So, you know, once we can gather this information, I'm going to be compiling it together into a kid-friendly form so the children can have this valuable information to take into generation and generation to come. That's so powerful. It's really important. Um, and to me, the, the drive that you have and your brother um, who's also going to be joining us in a few minutes, um, that the work that you're doing really shines a light on why it's important for linguists and other language activists and researchers today to document and make good audio recordings and make as much material available as possible because there will be future generations who want this material, just like yourself. Right. You know, getting into the archives, like finding out what's been published, what's been analyzed, you know, all of that is, all of those things, all of that work will carry down and be its own legacy. And, you know, a lot of the work of language activists today is um, really happening in obscurity, you know, people's own communities or the people around them don't understand the value of what they're doing, but it's because there will be descendants who want and crave this information to keep that cultural flame alive. And that's what you're doing. Yes. And thank you for everything that you're doing to help further that. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, we're, yeah, I'm very excited, very excited about um, like, you know, learning more about Woken and, and um, you know, seeing, seeing children speak it again. It's awesome. Yes. Um, I wanted to see if um, David Harrison, who's also from Living Tongues, I wanted to see if you had any um, questions or, or comments or thoughts about um, the t uh, work that um, Tania is talking about. It's really remarkable work. Thank you, Tania. It um, reminds me of um, some other language uh, reawakening efforts that have been going on with languages like Chidimacha, which is was spoken in Louisiana, and a handful of other languages. Um, of course, we have Leanne Hinton here, so I think I would like to defer to her um, <laughs> to talk a little bit about sleeping languages. Um, so I'll, I'll just say thank you for that beautiful song, and I'll maybe hand it off to Leanne. Oh yeah, Leanne, if you're here, um, if you can unmute. Oh, there you are, Leanne. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. Um, Hi. 
<laughs> you're a legend. I'm just so happy you're here. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, Tanela, that was that was just a beautiful song. Thank and you. Um, where I, I mean, there, there um, yeah, David wanted me to say a little bit about uh, uh, about sleeping languages that. Uh, um, We've certainly here in California got a lot of sleeping languages, but uh, they're being awakened by people who are able to find their documentation and and start learning it from documentation. Uh, I was you're in North Carolina, right? And yeah, um, and um, I know I I've gone to North Carolina um, and um, found I've found. Um, references to references to languages that I don't see any documentation of but you said you found a little bit and I'm wondering where you've been going to find your uh, your information on your language um, if I can bounce that one over to my brother who he is there in the wings um, and also Anna has been able to unearth so much for us so far. Um, most of what we have has come from Anna's findings and you know it was it started off with just a, a few words um, and now we're finding so much and that is closely related to Catawba. Mm. Um, yeah so um, back to what you said about uh, the few in the finding it's just hard to gather and you know Anna is really taking taking the reins on that and everything that we're getting is pretty much coming from what they're finding. Uh, yeah and I have to thank Greg Anderson too. Greg Anderson um, who's in Oregon has put yeah put a lot of effort into finding some of these works. Um, so it's uh, from uh, the ling linguist uh, Blair Roots, who some of you might know, uh, worked on um, uh, Catawba and also a morphological and phonological study of Woken. Um, as, um, Blair Roots being a, was a specialist of Siouan languages and other languages as well. So we're, we're searching for those things and Greg, Greg also um, has been unearthing <laughs> other documents too. I should say that uh, um, the name of the language, which I haven't seen spelled, but as you say it, sounds like it's going to be woken from sleeping now. <laughs> <laughs> I love that play on words. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> um, I'd like to bring in uh, Lavelle Pierce into the conversation since he's um, uh, a woken descendant also. Um, to hear your thoughts, Lavelle. So I'll just introduce him. Um, so Lovell Pierce, also known as Chief Lovell Eagle Elk, is an author, massage practitioner, fifth degree black belt, fitness trainer, and principal chief of the Scurry Woken of Cape Fear, North Carolina. His skills include teaching survival, combat, and natural medicine. Tuscarora elder and seer Ted Silverhand gave Eagle Elk his name because of his spiritual vision, lofty message, leadership, and ability to use his body in martial arts. Lavelle is currently in law enforcement school and he trains officers in combatives in Cape Fear, North Carolina. Welcome to the call. Hello, hello, how are you? Good, good, so glad you could be here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I've been listening to everything. It's it's awesome. Awesome. Yes, yes. Thanks for thanks for uh, thanks for being here with us. And um, uh, you heard Leanne Hinton also, who's a who's a linguist who has worked on many different Native American languages. Um, so I'm sure I've, Leanne will definitely keep yes. you in the loop about Woken and um, what we continue to find and and bring forward with Woken. <laughs> Definitely, absolutely. Um, yeah, Tania, she hit on a lot of, uh, she hit on some very important parts there. Um, Lawson left us some words. He left the, he left the vocabulary, but it's, um, it's short of being able to form sentences and have a conversation. So, um, you know, finding you and, and, um, and the Institute and uh, David has been a blessing. 
And uh, we're on the path that we didn't foresee, you know, reconstructing and putting it together. It's the same path that the Catabas took. And now we find ourselves on that same path. And I'm, I'm excited about it because um, as you are here in the poem, it's, it's, um, it's, it, it connects you to your culture, it connects you to your ancestors, and it defines you in a way. Uh, if you kill the language, you kill the people. Uh, the language survived, the people are not far. But let me stop. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, would you read your, your, um, your beautiful piece of uh, spoken word for us? Yes, ma'am. And um, I want to apologize for the lighting. I'm, I'm sitting outside and it's dark and I have the light on in the, in the truck. And, um, and I want to apologize ahead of time. Um, there's, you know, when I wrote this, um, it was, it was like, like I say in the poem, straight, it's given straight, no chaser. It's not, um, it's not X-rated anything like that, but it is, it is straight. And um, I don't want to offend anybody um, by any of the words that's in there. So apologies ahead of time. Um, you've read it already because I sent it to you. So yeah. <laughs> I, I assume that you've said you. Okay. Okay. No, we're so fine. It just got to know, I think there's a couple of children on the call. So just to notify, I saw a few younger faces. And so there's just a, there's just a couple words of slight profanity, but nothing that adults can't handle. And it's, it's beautiful. So yeah, do your thing. <laughs> just, you know, to know the kids, oh, children, maybe okay. they should go to the other room for a second. <laughs> oh, yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. All right. When I speak the language of my ancestors, I invoke the universal powers within. My ancestral tongue is more powerful than your sword and mightier than your pen. So you may find the next few verses to sound coarse, straight, no chaser. What do you expect when you weaponized your pen and your eraser? You said I'm extinct, but I'm here. I'm in the flesh. I'm real. I'm not a ghost. My people have always been here in the swamps of the Carolina coast. You think we're simple? Our land you couldn't wait to take it. What you call simple, we simply call sacred. You call simple things inferior because you didn't make it. It's people like you in positions of power and influence who successfully rewrote history by writing us out of it. And because of this, you're proud. When we try to express our uniqueness, meekness, and historical and cultural completeness, they say, get your head out the clouds. But I'm eagle. The clouds is where I fly. I soar next to the sun. And at night, the moonlight's in my eye. On the pages of their books, they changed our race and took our looks. They rewrote history, making us the white man's burden. Turning us into sheeple while the, whitey, the mighty white man continues hurting. They changed us from warriors to wimps from men to drug dealers and pimps, from healers to witches, and from women to bitches, from proud of your family name to loud with no shame, from standing upright to slouching with no fight. Docility is your tranquility. Ignorance is bliss, blue over red pill. Still you have no ability. From being a father to your child to being absent, and that's putting it mild. And mothers not seeing the need of a man because society said it. The government is more than happy to discipline your children if you let it. Cops killing kids, red, black, and brown. Kids killing cops as a way to be down. And now with open season on the full brown spectrum, blacks, Africans, Hispanics, and Indians are the victims. So when we see police automatically the bad ones, we expect them. It's time to turn the tables from reactive to proactive and put our boots on them, in them, and up the rectums. Kids full of anger, but this anger is misdirected. This leads to racial profiling as you have already suspected. Education is the key, but not from their books. So if education is the key, where do I look? 
Try your ancestors, your elders, and your family to start. Others who are on this path is a good place to start. Paper trails because paper tells, but paper fails if paper tells. That's a play on words and spelling. Can you see me? Because you have eyes and ears, but I'm really talking about the eye that doesn't shed tears, your third eye. See, one tale is religious myths. One tale is spiritual gifts. Telltale signs of perverted minds. Thinking divinity divine belongs to only one kind, really? For example, if you believe in Jesus, then you'll be saved. Or if you accept Muhammad, then you've got it made. Or only Torah can cure mankind. Or maybe the Buddhists are the only divine. Sikhism, Taoism, didn't man start this walk? If they were all from God, would we even be having this talk? I love my family regardless of their belief, but unfortunately, your belief has caused much grief. Separating family through politics and religion. On the East Coast, we can easily see this division. Especially, especially in the Southeast, you can easily spot this beast. But at least some of us are trying to reunite and come together and feast. Everyone can't be right and claiming the other wrong. So please realize you're stuck in a loop of the same lame song, repeating history through ignorance of self, giving away your power, material wealth, and sacrificing your health. Yep, the dark side requires sacrifice. No joke. That's why our ceremonies require some smoke, hip, tobacco, and all mother's plants given to heal. This is my stance. Tobacco was healing before Europeans. Now it's toxic to all human beings. Hip was used for clothes. And medicine, no lie, but they've turned it into the evil weed that only makes people high. The indigenous way is the only play. So to save our mother from erosion and decay, to save our kids from the pitfalls of every day and the perpetual genocide we face every day. I choose the native way because my children are too important to me to look the other way. I love my children and my family is up top. My nation is my station before my next stop in the spirit world and other dimensional planes but while i'm here my job is to help balance the insane some will see and some will hear some will love and some will fear where you find the language the people are near by the way our mantra is we're still here I don't know about you, but I consider that a major strike. My existence and my persistence is my show of resistance. I speak, I write with my ancestors, and I walk. Language is the key. We're not extinct because I talk. My sacred tongue, spoken word forever, as I wear my eagle hawk and my turkey feather. I hope. Oh, yes. <laughs> Wow, incredible. Thank you for sharing that stream of consciousness with us. That was amazing. Um, I want to bring Diana Kelly say Thank you. I'm glad y'all enjoyed it. <laughs> it was there, yeah, that's like you're um I, I feel like you're you're this vessel that's like all these different ideas are coming together and coalescing. And um and and when you you talk about your indigenous heritage also it's um it's just so powerful um and some of the rhymes you came up with like there's something that rhymed with eraser that was just so perfect i was like <laughs> he's killing it oh wow um i wanted to bring in um diana kelly syed back into the conversation to get your thoughts uh and feedback on lovell's pierce um, lovell pierce's piece Oh, well, for, thank you for letting me pipe in now. Lovell, that was like, that was so incredible. I mean, thank you so much for that. I, um, thank you. You know, I'm always, I, <laughs> I always love hearing these stories that we often don't hear because to me that is where the hope for the future is uh, and stories like yours and your sisters and other people on this call. But I want to ask you and your sister, you know, I, I, I've been in North Carolina now for about a decade. And I just, when did you, growing up, did you have a strong sense of who you were? Or can you sort of summarize the process of um, 
embodying all of these wonderful parts of your identity? Absolutely. Um, we're actually, um, there's different uh, Tuscarora communities and Skarure is how you say Tuscarora in the, in the um, Iroquois language, in the Tuscarora language is Skarure. And there's different communities here in uh, North Carolina. We just happen to be the one that's in the Southeast, I mean, in the Cape Fear. And what sets us apart from some of the other communities, we are also Wokan. So that is who we are down in the Cape Fear region. The Cape Fear River is the main artery, the main river running uh, from uh, uh, the mouth of, um, right there in the ocean from Wilmington, running through the state. So um, our ancestors were, um, I would guess, I would say a part of the Tuscarora Confederacy. So in the, seven, in the 1700s, uh, after the war, and um, a lot of the Tuscarora were kind of, uh, um, for lack of a better way to say it, disbanded. A lot of uh, the people, the Tuscarora people in Indian Woods Reservation had to um, move in different directions just to survive. So there's a few of the chiefs from there that came down to this region where I live and, um, and, and live with their kinsmen down this way. So, you know, to make a long story short, we have two bloodlines. Our main bloodline is, is Wokan. You also see an alternative spelling, which is Wakama. Wokan disappeared on the map, Wakama appeared. So, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I could be a little chatty sometimes, but, um, the language, the language of, the, uh, of uh, Wokan, we want to revive it, bring it back because it's ours and it's a way to keep our, our folks alive here. Um, I know you asked about growing up. Um, in this area, it's, we grew up conscious of native culture, but we did not participate in native culture. Um, a lot of people moved out of the designated native areas here for uh, to go to integrated schools because they felt like those were better than going to the Indian schools. So some of the families moved out of the Indian areas to go to the integrated schools and also to work at the mills. So the families that moved out of the Indian areas, if you were my complexion, then you fell into the black community. If you had more of a European look, then you fell into the white community. Um, and there was, you're either on one side or the other. And because of that, there's a lot of resentment between um, some of the black community and the native communities here. But we grew up conscious of it because all of us went to school together. Um, the Wakama Suwan, um, us, I mean, we all went to school together. So yeah, we grew up conscious. We just didn't participate when we were little. My dad told me something. I told you I'm chatty. So I'm a, I'm a tone it down a minute. My dad told me something and he told my son the same thing. He said, you're just as Indian as they are. Now, my dad didn't participate in the culture, but he knew that he knew that about himself. So he wanted to make sure I knew this and he told my sons and wanted to make sure that they knew this. So yeah, we grew up knowing, but we didn't participate. So now, um, one of my elder cousins, um, he's 70 some years old. He said, it's never too late to reclaim your history. And that's what we're doing. Thank you. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for... it takes so long. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. I could see you have like a strong, because your family uh, has really been centered around the Cape Fear region for a long time. So you never, you can see that like direct lineage, right? Yeah. So there, there's yes. like, yeah, land, yeah. language and landscape that helps you um, like connect those dots together. And like you said, it's never too late. Um, it's never too late to revive it. And that's, um, that's what I, I try to tell um, any students uh, or, or scholars or researchers or anyone who are, um, anyone who's interested in this field, I say, look, the, the work that we're doing is really powerful, especially for the communities themselves and descendants who will come later and who are trying to revive what's been lost. That's a really essential. Thank you yes. so much for, for sharing too. And I, I wanted to, to see if Tania had any, had any thoughts as well about that, about your, um, your ancestry and 
and growing up and um, reclaiming. He covered, he covered everything in great detail. Um, I'll just add on to say, you know, yes, we are still here and shouting it from the mountaintops. And like you said, it's never too late to reclaim your heritage. It's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's great. Um, well, we're still, we're still going to stick around for a few more minutes here. I know it's been an hour, so I'm going to start wrapping it up. Um, and uh, I just want to thank every single participant who came. Um, I'm going to share a, a short poem. Um, and also, I'll, we'll hear also from uh, Diana Kelly Sayed, also a few more closing thoughts. And um, if anyone has some, some questions, we can accommodate, you know, th uh, three, four questions in the chat so please type your questions in the chat and um, for anyone who still wants to stick around I know we're past an hour but please stick around and we'll, we'll try to get to some of some of your um, questions from the group as well so I'm going to read a short poem here um, this is um, inspired by my work uh, working with um, language archives every day and building dictionaries with um, different communities around the world. So I often encounter these really interesting um, terms that make my brain explode a little bit and, um, or just, you know, these words with just the beautiful, um, uh, beautiful expression to them. So I put a couple of those in this, in this poem. This is called The Unfamiliar Every Day. And the title is about, I'm just constantly going through this unfamiliar territory a little bit every day trying to trying to bring together um, something that's cohesive so that we can present ourselves you know publicly as like sharing this information in the good right kindest way possible so um, the unfamiliar every day yokomta an ishir word for the three-banded armadillo otherwise known as the tatu bolita when threatened by a predator Yokomta rolls up into a ball, its armor protecting it from all. Yokomta. An hechum, to dance or to buck, a verb in Tewelche, no speakers left, but with a little luck, people will learn it and conjure its movements once more. An hechum. Aya, you've come to the wrong place or gone the wrong way. That's what Apatani speakers say when a fellow traveler goes astray. Aya. Ivuch is an Aran word for song, a breath that moves with melodic plays, a way for the ancestors to stay a little longer and sing. Ivuch. Asisia, a raspberry in Tutlo Saponi. They rebuilt their language from echoes, turned archives into gold. For Hina, mother and Tati, father, the kinship that's always been there, and they might dare to have new words that replace English. I've built my life with words like bricks. When languages die, the pain, it sticks to my insides, the dull ache of death. What have we lost? What will we take? What's going to last? What's going to break? Only a million years of history, invisible to the naked ear, but our blood hears the sounds loud and clear, the whispers of ghosts in our hearts. Thank you. <laughs> nice, lovely, love it. <laughs> Thanks Lavelle, appreciate you. <laughs> um, yes, um, I wanna bring in, thank you. Um, some of the people have to go. That's fine. Nice to meet you, Anna Ruth. Um, I'd like to bring it back to uh, Diana Kelly Syed um, to get to hear some of your thoughts. Thank you. Um, thank you all. I, this, I've, as I just said to someone in a private chat, like I, this is so fascinating to see, but also it's so horrific to see so so many stories in so many languages that have almost disappeared. And I think in so many ways, that is the story of America and where we are at at this moment. Um, I am an American. I was born and raised in the rural South. And lately I've been thinking a lot about America's origin stories and the fact that we're fighting over who gets to tell the story of America 
and the story that is gaining, gaining so much resonance is often a myth, this myth of a white America, which is not really the full story. And this became very apparent to me when I went home um, earlier this year in June, and I was born and raised in North Florida, right on the Florida, Georgia, Alabama state line. And 10 miles from where I was raised is a historic site called the Negro Fort or the African Fort. And this was a, 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 it was built by the British and then abandoned and taken over by free blacks, fugitive slaves and Choctaw and Creek Indians. And it became an incredibly important hub um, for that economy, which at that time was um, in the southernmost border of the United States. Florida was not yet a state, so it was outside of the United States. But it became a, a place that harbored uh, slaves as they were uh, as they were seeking freedom, and it established important uh, trade routes between the free blacks in that area and and the Seminole Indians in the south southern part of Florida. And of course, uh, they offered a resistance as American troops started to come in. They were a major a major force of resistance. And of course, the fort was destroyed in a horrific battle, led um, or commissioned by Andrew Jackson. And the resistance to the destruction of the Negro Fort started the first battle of the Seminole Wars, if I am correct. This was this is part of a major, major indigenous and black history that occurred 10 miles from where I was raised, and nobody ever told me. I had to be in my 40s before I first heard about it. Mm -hmm. And what is remarkable is very nearby the African Fort is a piece of land that in 1950, um, preacher slash lawyer decided by his interpretation of the Bible was the original Garden of Eden. <laughs> what? <laughs> he even turned it into a tourist, uh, a tourist trap for a couple of years. And of course, he was an older, an older white man who decided to literally put me, turn this into God's country. Mm. And that is the story that people tell of this land. They don't tell the story of the actual history, which was an important side of resistance for Black and Indigenous America. And I think that sums up so much of what is happening in this country, that the real wonderful history of what this country has been and what it could be is often the history and the stories that are omitted, are hidden, are archived away. And the basis of story, the technology of stories is language. And when we lose language, when we lose stories, all of us collectively living in a country, we also lose a very important part of who we are. So I want to thank all of you who are doing the work to, to wake the sleeping languages, those of you who are trying to recapture your heritage, the future of this country, and I'm speaking as an American right now, the future of this country, God willing, will belong to you. Thank you, um, Anna, for inviting me and Penn to be part of this. And thank you all for hanging out a little over an hour to be part of this story, this new story that we're telling. Wow. You, yeah. Thank you for articulating that so well, Diana. Um, I really want to open it up here for the last few minutes um, to hear from any of the other. Um, there's so many amazing people on this call. Um, uh, please um, share your thoughts now. It's an open floor. <laughs> For example, Lily Chase, are you there? Do you want to talk about um, what you just posted? Uh, hi, yeah, sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for putting this together. This has been so interesting. Um, so I just graduated um, this July uh, with a degree in linguistics from the University of Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And I have a personal interest in minority and endangered languages and language revitalization and all of this stuff that we're here for right now. Um, uh, so I'm from Maine and on coming home after finishing my degree, I kind of looked around and realized that there's this whole culture of the Penobscot people of our mm -hmm. local Native American culture that I have obviously grown up around and know nothing about as generally is the way um, <laughs> in these things. and. I, as someone who's very passionate about these minority languages and trying to be an activist for um, 
these kinds of things, I would love to kind of reach out to the people involved and try to get involved myself. I'm just wondering if anybody has any suggestions as a white person, um, how to do that respectfully and kind of in the best way possible, if there is a way to do that respectfully or just any thoughts on that kind of stuff. Oh. Hundred percent. No, it's a great question. And if you are based in uh, Penobscot territory, mm -hmm. I would um, you you know offer offer yourself as someone you know who could help um, at their community. I know they have. Um, I have been in touch with them myself, but I know that they're trying to do different um, Penobscot reclamation projects. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, they've managed to get signage in certain public spaces in Penobscot. Mm. So that's um, that I've heard I've seen that in the news and in the media. So um, as someone who's trained in linguistics, that's something that you can help elevate and, and document their efforts to to try to do that um, and try to try to see, you know, what is it that those indigenous language activists need and if and if they want an outsider to work with them on it, you know, to yeah. just have like respectful, kind conversation, just as you are, you know, talk to them and just say, hey, I'm here, I have a background in linguistics. Um, it, that, that might be, that might be a great thing to, to work on a team with several people. But of course, if they don't want outsiders to come in, then of course, that's their prerogative, you know, so yeah. it's, it's no problem. Then there, um, you can, you can write to me and we can um, keep in touch. Um, Margaret Newton just posted um, an interesting link for you, language resources in Penobscot. Yeah. Um, and uh, in the future, we, yeah, we're holding other uh, webinars uh, for other training purposes too. So, you know, we'd love to have you, Lily, so you can learn the other, other skills that we're, that we're sharing too. And, you know, whether you work with Penobscot or a different local community in the Northeast, um, uh, that would be great. We'd love to keep in touch with you. Great. Thank you so much. This has been great. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, Can I say Anna? something? Yes, yes. Hi. How are Hi. you? Hi. Hi, Anna. ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo estás? ¿Qué tal? Mucho gusto. <laughs> Qué bien. Um, uh, I speak a few different languages, and I've always been interested in learning languages and continuing um, the work of uh, people who are interested in um, elevating their culture and retaining the wisdom within their own languages. Mm -hmm. um, I spent uh, close to a decade in Peru, so I'm familiar with uh, and and Anna, you're I'm sure you're familiar with that with that. Um, uh, so I'm I'm familiar with many of the languages that are um, being revived right now, even by the government, uh, especially during this pan pandemic time, which is really great to see. I'm seeing all sorts of news programs and um, um, educational programs in Yanesha, uh, yeah. Yanesha <laughs> um, in Ashaninka, in Matsigenga, in uh, Quechua, of course, in Aymara. Um, but what I'm also seeing is revival of um, once extinct languages. So, so now in the north coast of, uh, of Peru, in Lambayeque, mm -hmm. um, in that region, actually was one of the regions that I lived in, um, there are now 80 speakers of Muchik, which oh, is really? Mochica language. That's great. So we should have conversations about this. If you would, if you would like, because I know some of the anthropologists in, in the area that are actually promoting this. Sure. Um, yeah, so sure. Might, yeah, might please uh, write to me because that's, it, it's very interesting. Uh, my, um, just for you all to know, like my heritage is uh, Peruvian and French Canadian. And mm -hmm. so I spend a lot of time uh, working in Peru with the Anisha community and other Amazonian communities. And also, and I'm trying to reclaim um, Quechua in my own life since that was my, my grandmother's language. And she still understands it, but she hasn't spoken it since she was a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, so those are very interesting conversations and it would be great to do another forum like this, but specifically for Latin America. I would, I would well, love specifically to specifically for Peru. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, um, really, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of traditional, um, you know, uh, ecological knowledge that is transmitted through language, just like we heard in, um, you know, in the poetry, the beautiful poetry that was, that was stated today, that was sung today, that was uh, proclaimed and declaimed, 
um, and you know very very emotionally and very heartfeltly ex exposed in terms of your you know the, each person's um, personal experience vis-a-vis -vis their language as a vehicle for expressing their world um, and um, I'm, I'm also uh, very much interested in in um, how th this intersection of uh, architects um, and engineers and technologists are looking at traditional, you know, ecological knowledge. Uh, Julia Watson is a, a brilliant architect uh, out of uh, Columbia and uh, New York, who who's really doing a great job of it. She's written a book and um, recently called Low Tech. And um, oh yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Cool. And uh, and she was also there's a video that I was watching yesterday because she did a live live screen, uh, sorry, stream rather on the Long Now Institute. Mm -hmm. So I'll send you that link. Um, yeah, I don't and if you could post that in the chat too. Sure, um, I'll actually that do would... that right now because the her yeah. her she she had a TED talk and she wrote a book, but she then she she had this. Uh, sort of recap of her TED talk and a question and answer about her methodologies and and the importance and and she's really a really sharp woman, um, you know, uh, scholar, um, enthusiast about traditional um, uh, indigenous knowledge um, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and how it's so important for us to be looking at that as also yeah. a reason for preserving languages. I mean. Apart from the fact that it's as as human beings, we're all denizens of this earth, and these really were these aspects of our humanity are all part of who we are as people. Mm -hmm. So, regardless of where we originally come from locally, you know, we think global, act local. I think in the same ways we can do the inverse, and so it's it's so important to um, to honor that piece of humanity, which may be far away, but really is, speaks to who we are as human beings. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you brought it together really uh, beautifully. You know, it's like ecological knowledge, land, heritage, spirit, poetry, all of these things are interconnected. And yet, when you go into academia, some of the students on this call might know this, everything is very, um, uh, divided, you know, and it's like, you got to go into this specialty, you got to go over here. Um, and so in, um, in interdisciplinary work, it, it become it becomes hard because we've been so separated from the different pools of knowledge and just working in this field, I've had the experience, um, to realize that I really need to become an ethnobotanist <laughs> and a zoologist and, um, learn about so many other subfields, you know, because when we're documenting names for, like birds and plants and insects, like you really realize that we, we just don't have a deep scientific knowledge about the ecology. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's, it's all interconnected and, and language is, is what is the vehicle that mm -hmm. brings all of this knowledge together. And so when you lose, when you lose language, you, you lose the, the ecological knowledge as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very deep. Um, thank you so much for your comments. And please, yeah, please write to me, um, send me an email, and I'd, I'd be happy to talk with you more. <laughs> okay, that's great. Weeks, that's well, it's, so it's lovely to be on the call with so many like-minded people and people who are interested in um, looking at language from cultural as well as from, you know, an identity lens. Um, and there's so many different lenses we can look at it from, but preserving languages, whatever they are, is, is so very important for our own you know, species as as human beings. I think it's uh, it's important for our our global human identity. You're totally right, hundred percent, hundred percent. I loved your last song, by the way, um, the um, the one that you just published. Just um, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Anna Dagno, Dagno, je parle français aussi, um, oh. is. Uh, goes by the name of Kilia, who is, uh, or I think you say Quilla, right? Kilia? Yeah. <laughs> uh, she you. has this wonderful new song called Un Alma del Norte y del Sur, which is a uh, soul uh, from the north and from the south. And it uh, brings the Chacana um, Andean uh, cross, for lack of a better word, um, Cosmovision into the four and it's it's sung in, in Spanish, but you should check it out. I'll put the link in in the, the chat too. It's wow, thank really you. Good. That's very kind. <laughs> it's, it's it's a lovely song. I was listening to it last night. 
Thank you so much. Anyway, I really appreciate that. I'm sure a lot of other people have lots of things to say as well. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I would love to hear from, um, uh, we had a couple comments from students. We have Natalie Martinez. Um, would love to hear from you if you're still on the call and then Briss Peralta as well. Um, hello? Yeah, anyway, hi, um, my name is Natalie. Um, I'm an undergraduate here. I go to UNLV here in Las Vegas and I'm studying anthropology and French. And I'm genuinely hoping to become involved with this work after I graduate. And I just feel very small. I don't know how to exactly engage with this work um, and serve as an ally um, with this work uh, just as a student all the way from here. And so I, if you have any insight on that on how I can collaborate with this work or um, learn more about it, that would be wonderful. I, what you say, it's, I, I feel myself in you exactly 10 years ago. I just, I, I was just starting to do this kind of work and I felt very small and actually I was just rethinking about that and um, like a few days ago I was like hmm how could I describe um, the journey from like knowing nothing to still knowing nothing <laughs> but weaving together connections you know because uh, I think it's important that small feeling is not a bad feeling it means that you're humble and that you're trying to approach it in the right way and that you don't know where to go yet, but something will open up in front of you, you know? So it, it's, it, it's, there's so much, there's so many places to discover. And so what I would like um, suggest to you is you know, look at where you are located now and see if there's a language project where you can get involved or look at your own ancestry and see if you want to work on revitalizing any of those languages um, or look at another region that you're interested in. I think, did you post about uh, Lenka? Yes, Lenka. I have uh, Salvadoran and Colombian, Colombian roots. So um, I looked at Lenka and it, it's in between um, Honduras and El Salvador. Mm -hmm. uh, there's efforts um, in Honduras, but however the territory in El Salvador was um, taken by mining industries. I know Berta Cáceres um, is well known for her work there, mm -hmm. um, um, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. And so that's where um, I'm looking into learning more about the efforts there and hoping to see what El Salvador can do to also um, join the efforts that Honduras is doing. Yeah, just immerse yourself in all the publications you can find, you know, in English and Spanish from that region. Some stuff might only be available in Spanish. So, you know, look, look up um, all of that, download as much as you can, and try to have meetings during the pandemic with any researcher who's still alive that has a, who has worked in those regions. Um, I haven't personally worked there, but I have had a couple of email exchanges with people from those areas. Um, I have a close friend who's an archaeologist who works um, in traditional Lenca territory and she said it's very difficult working there right now because there's a, a lot of um, violence and um, other things going on. So um, it would be, I, I would always suggest when you're first starting to work on a language project so that you don't get discouraged, you know, don't go to the most difficult place to work, but try to um, work in one or two other places where where you can understand the dynamics the geography the history and everything and um don't put yourself in in danger even though of course like that community um they i'm sure they need help with their language documentation and revitalization plans so i would just be be careful you know with going there um but i, I will if you send me an email i do have some link of resources so i will try to send them your way but um, I'm, I'm enthusiastic. I'm really excited for you to, uh, to continue learning and to work on projects in the future. Thank you so much. And thank you for organizing this wonderful event. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, uh, we are going to uh, wrap it up soon. We did have a couple last comments from uh, Briss Peralta and Dylan Charter. Um, Briss, I don't know, Bryce or Briss, I'm not sure if I'm It's actually pronounced Brie. Um, oh, cool, it's a silent S. 
Yes. Okay, nice. Hi. <laughs> um, so I'm going into my senior year of high school right now, but I'm very interested in like linguistics and foreign languages and all of this work, like saving endangered languages. And um, I was just asking uh, if anybody could like recommend some schools I should look into for like linguistics programs. Yes, if you can send me your email address, I have um, a list, um, in, yeah, including um, Swarthmore and Haverford uh, would, might be a good option for you. And I can send you, um, I have another list by email um, of schools, about half a page that have language documentation programs. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. And um, thank you, Bree. That was great. And Dylan Charter, are you still on the call? I didn't have a question. I was just answering Bree's. Oh, I see. Okay, cool. You were just suggesting about Swarthmore and Haverford? Yeah. yeah. Okay, wonderful. Did you have any other thoughts or feedback about the program today? Um, no, I don't think so. It was just good to listen to. Great. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you were here. This was wonderful. Um, I'd love to open it up to any of the speakers or artists today. Um, do you want to, uh, does anyone want to give any closing thoughts before we wrap up? Well, I'd like to say something. Sure, George, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I just want to say that uh, I just want to thank everyone who attended the event today for attending and thank you Anna Luisa for organizing this wonderful event. Um, I, it was a real honor for me to be here and uh, it inspired me a lot because um, I myself have some, have some uh, distant ancestry which is a, a Coptic Egyptian who spoke the Coptic language which is a language that descends from the ancient Egyptians but is a uh, spoken by much, much fewer people uh, today, unfortunately. Um, and so it, it inspires, I mean, it inspires me to keep, uh, keep up on my learning of the language and uh, work hopefully on revital revitalizing it. So thank you very much for, for that. Good luck to you, George. I, I really encourage you to look at the, the few Coptic resources out there. There is some interesting stuff out there and you know, weave that into, I know you're doing a lot of other kinds of language work, but weaving that, um, that presence of Coptic and having that part of your ancestry will, it will um, give you inspiration for the other work that you're doing, you know, and, yeah. and to, for people to know that you have Coptic background, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. It's something that you can share, you know, and something that most people don't know about. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And so, yeah, and can I say something? Oh yes, Felipe. <laughs> sure. Hola. Yeah. Just hola, que tal? Uh, Just one thing. Um, I don't know if you uh, may or may not may not know, but in the U.S. there are there is a huge population of indigenous diaspora. Mm -hmm. For those who are um, seeking to work with the community, you might just find in your backyard that there are uh, indigenous speakers any anywhere in the U.S., especially from Mexico, Central America, and South America, you know, so I know that um, you don't have to go all the way to uh, Latin America to work with these uh, endangered languages. And um, I, I've been working just in with linguists and also my community in, in Los Angeles. So just something that to keep in mind. Oh, that's so true. I was, I had that thought earlier um, when you were, um, when you were doing your poetry and I, um, it escaped me at that time, but it's very, yeah, it's, it's a really important, um, it's a really important point that we're all part of diasporas, you know, so many of us live here and we have indigenous roots from different parts of the world and um, it, it is possible to find other like-minded people in the U.S. Who, who have the same origins, but like find, look, look for them online. And that's the way you can connect. And eventually after the pandemic, you'll be able to meet them in person <laughs> one day, we hope, <laughs> right? <laughs> so thanks all. Um, we'll wrap it up here since it's 8.30. Um, I'll be looking at everyone's email address that they posted in here. Please post your email in the chat if you wanna get some follow-up information. And probably in the next few days, I'll email everyone who came uh, to this call. So I'll tell you where you can find more resources and we'll try to um, organize another reading a few months from now.
with more Indigenous poets and writers. So thank you all so much. And I'll leave it open for um, a little bit more time while people put their emails in here. Thank you all and have a good night. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Anna, for organizing this. Yes, uh, just wanted thank to you. thank you. Thank you, Anna. It was space. great. Thank you very much. It was, a pleasure. it was a pleasure being in the company of all of you. Have a great one. Talk to you soon. You too. Bye, you all. Take care, everyone. Thanks everyone. And we'll post this recording um, on the Living Tongues page in the coming days. Yeah, thank you so much. It's nice to meet all of you. <laughs>